unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant the Masha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. Ambassador Nirupama Rao has had the kind of career that every Indian Foreign Service aspirant dreams of. In 2011, she retired as Foreign Secretary to the Government of India, the senior most position in the Foreign Service. She served as spokesperson for the Ministry of External Affairs, ambassador to Sri Lanka, ambassador to China, and ambassador to the United States of America. After retiring from government, however, she's added a new title to her lengthy CV, Historian. Her new book, The Fractured Himalaya, India, Tibet, China, 1949 to 1962, is a deep dive into one of the most consequential periods of India-China relations, a period whose repercussions are felt even today. To talk more about her book and the state of China-India relations, Ambassador Rao joins me on Zoom. Ambassador, congratulations on the book and thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much, Milan. It's wonderful to be here and to uh, connect with you on Grand Tamasha. So let me ask you to start maybe by kind of sketching out the motivation. Um, in the very first few pages of the book, you mentioned that, you know, this period of relations between China and India, 1949 to 1962, is in some sense well-traveled territory, right? Yours is, is, is not the first book on this period. However, you felt that in looking at the literature, there was something missing and something that perhaps a practitioner such as yourself could really bring to the conversation. So what is it that you thought was missing and what is it that you thought you could contribute from your own vantage point? You're right, Milan, that this is a territory well traversed. Many people have written on the subject, particularly the events leading to the war of 1962. Incidentally, we commemorate 60 years of that war next year in 2022. I decided to write this book, uh, I think, firstly, because of the fact that there is a renewed focus on the problems that we face along our shared frontier with China, particularly after Galwan in June of 2020, and all the difficulties that surround that the India-China relationship today. The other reason was that as a diplomat practitioner, I, my eye has been trained to look at the passage of these events uh, through uh, the lens of having actually dealt with some of these issues and understood the salience of certain factors, particularly, especially the role of uh, what I call the human quotient in the relationship, the role of bureaucrats who were in positions of responsibility and took the decisions that, you know, cascaded in many ways uh, to cause the complexities that surround uh, the problems that we face with China today. I wanted to also focus on the role of Nehru as a leader, as the architect of our China policy, and how there were essential contradictions between India's foreign policy towards China at that time and India's frontier policy towards China at that time. So these were some of the reasons that I decided to write a book. It's not a book about the Sino-Indian frontier. It's not a book about the history of the boundary between the two countries. There's been enough of literature that has been produced about that. But I tried to look at the policy decisions and the uh, manners, manner of negotiation and the outcomes to that negotiation and the, the decisions, many of them ad hoc, that were taken. But my purpose, my motive was not to you know, put Nehru in the in the uh, witness box, as it were. I my aim was not to apportion blame for decisions uh, made or not made, or bad or good decisions. I I have tried to present a set of mov moving pictures. I call it a Netflix approach to diplomacy, uh, because there are you know each chapter cover, covers events. I mean, you can picture them, and I all I have mentioned in the introduction that anybody who looks at this, especially a young demographic, should apply both reason and imagination to try and visualize what happened during that period. So, so you mentioned that, you know, there are a set of very important characters in, in a way in your book, both bureaucrats and politicians. There is perhaps no greater character in your book than Nehru, India's first prime minister. And you write early on that for Nehru, China was an affair of both the head and the heart. 
right? So, so for those who, who aren't familiar with the history, help us understand what sort of at the root of Nehru's, you know, both sort of mental and emotional fascination with China. Yes, you know, if one studies the life of Nehru, and particularly the years prior to independence and his interaction uh, with China, with Russia, uh, with the rest of the world particularly, you understand that Nehru pitched his tent in, in a universe of freedom and liberation struggles of nations emerging from colonialism and Western domination of countries finding, discovering, rediscovering their identity again and building essentially or rebuilding long lost ties of friendship and cooperation with their neighbors. And I believe when it came to China, he saw China as more in the geo-civilizational sense, uh, not so much in the geopolitical sense. He looked at the affinities that exist between India and China as two of the essentially the the, uh, the kind of source uh, civilizations in Asia. In many ways, the influence of these two countries has been great across the Asian continent. And I think he wanted India and China to cooperate and build an alignment, not an alliance, but an alignment which would essentially constitute a third force in world politics. You understand this was played out against the landscape of the Cold War and Nehru uh, did not want India to be part of any bloc and you know the the the, the naissance, as it were, of non-alignment which flowed from that. And he, he visualized India and China crafting, you know, these principles of peaceful coexistence that would in a sense, be a primer for foreign relations between all countries, especially in the developing world. So China, uh, in uh, Nehru, I think, was very much like Isaiah Berlin's fox. He knew many things. He was not master of one, but uh, he, he had perhaps the outlook. He had a modern outlook, but he very much had the heart of an idealist, of a visionary. And I don't fault him for that. I think uh, we need more of that kind of leadership if we are to really look ahead uh, as, as, uh, as a global community. So your narrative on Tibet really begins with the PLA's 1950 decision to send troops into Tibet and forcibly seize territory. And you note at one point, and I really like this phrase, that China-India relations is a three-body problem with Tibet serving as a kind of third wheel in a sense. And I'm wondering, again, just to take us back for a moment, could you sort of set the stage by helping us understand what was the strategic and cultural significance that Tibet held at the time? Yes, uh, you know, the emotional attachment that uh, many and most Indians feel towards the Himalayas and Tibet, which is very much a part of that landscape, is extremely strong and it dates back. It goes back for millennia. So it's not as if India has claimed Tibet in any way. That's not the reason for this attachment. But Tibet, you know, is the place of... Uh, a, a very sacred place for most Indians. It's a place of pilgrimage. You know, many of us, including myself, have made the pilgrimage to Kailash and Mansarovar in Western Tibet. And uh, so it is... It, it, it is really, as somebody said, it's the place of high peaks and sacred earth, uh, Tibet, for India. So that was the connection. However, when the PLA entered Tibet, and they literally had a walkover in 1950-51, there were voices in Nehru's cabinet that were extremely concerned. Sardar Vallabhai Patel, his deputy prime minister, was a leading voice in that regard. And mind you, although we fault Nehru for having forged friendship with China and refused to really look at the downside of what might happen with a with a big country bringing its troops right up to the Himalayan frontier. Uh, when I looked at the archives, when I studied the records and from my own experience of the subject, I understood that Nehru, even as he spoke of friendship with China and reached out to his counterpart, Premier Zhou Enlai, he understood also that the real challenge across the spine of Asia was the challenge between that 
each of these countries posed to each other. And uh, he was somebody, despite, you know, what his uh, detractors may say, he was also a prime minister, a head of government, who focused a great deal on extending Indian administration right up to the northeastern frontier, the frontier that we call the McMahon Line. Uh, that is, you know, the frontier between Arunachal Pradesh uh, today, as we call it, and the Tibet Autonomous Region. And I think, I, when I think back, and, and um, today with the benefit of hindsight, the decisions that were taken in early 1950, 1951 by the government of India to to extend its administration right up to the McMahon line, right up to the northeastern frontier with Tibet, I think have stood India in very, very good stead. The problem, uh, what w the problem that arose was essentially in Ladakh, in eastern and northeastern Ladakh, in the arid plateau that we call the Aksai Chin, because uh, it was really impossible to extend administration. That uh, terrain did not support any life. It did not contain, you know, it did not have water. It did not have vegetation. It was a, what in Spanish they call an altiplano, a very high altitude area. And uh, India, India, well, if there was a sin of omission, it was the neglect that India uh, sort of the neglect that you could attribute to India when it came uh, to covering the Aksai Chin and ensuring its security because it fell within India's frontiers as marked on India's uh, maps from, especially from 1954 onwards. You know, I, you alluded to this a second ago, but I was fascinated to learn that after the Chinese takeover of Tibet, Nehru didn't immediately perceive uh, the, the kind of pressing military danger uh, from this action. But there, of course, were voices in the cabinet like Patel and others who were very exercised by this. Um, but when we step back and think about the border dispute, uh, in the book, you argue that negotiations starting from about the mid-1950s on the future of sort of India's privileges in Tibet you argue they would have yielded greater value if they'd been part of a more comprehensive discussion of the frontier. And I guess my question to you is, why was the government at that point in time so reluctant to sort of take up the unsettled issue of the border at, at that particular point? I think first and foremost, there was a total inexperience, let, let us say, diplomatically in dealing uh, with a country like China. There was no previous history of having had any diplomatic interaction with China. And uh, the events concerning Tibet had happened so quickly, so quickly after independence. And if you look back and visualize the kind of challenges India faced at that time, national consolidation, bringing uh, this vast country together, the economic challenges, internal, uh, you know, turbulence in some parts of the country, or, and then, of course, the troubles with Pakistan over Kashmir. So uh, it was uh, it was a very, very, uh, the chalice that India inherited at partition and independence was overflowing with these problems. So um, India's tryst with destiny uh, was a very complicated tryst uh, with destiny. So when it came to China, uh, India assumed and the Chinese uh, moved. I mean, this was diplomacy by stealth, if you can call it. They wanted to study the problem more, the Chinese. They did not know much about the frontiers with India. Um, and many of the archives had been taken away by the nationalist Chinese to Taiwan. Uh, they were new in Tibet. Their Communist Party cadres were just settling in, interacting with, with the Tibetan, um, you know, the higher ups to understand the nature of the issues concerning the frontier with India. And China did not raise these issues. It was a conscious, deliberate decision taken by China at the level of Premier Cho and Lai not to raise issues that were not ripe, that was the word they used, for discussion with India. So India kind of walked into that, you know, it was delusional diplomacy, as I've called it in any in some other part of the book. India felt that, you know, the, the fact that China had not raised 
the question of the frontier, assumed that China acquiesced in much of what India uh, depicted as far as her frontier was concerned. Although there were many maps that were being published from time to time in China that showed the frontiers with India totally differently from that depicted on Indian maps. In, uh, Nehru, I think, was consumed with this desire not to be seen as trafficking, as it were, in imperialist privileges when it came to Tibet. Because if you recall, much of the rights and privileges and obligations that responsibilities that India inherited as far as Tibet was concerned was essentially a, a, a legacy from the British Raj and from the, you know, the closing years of the empire from 1914 onwards. So, in Nehru consciously decided that the political office in Lhasa uh, would be renamed as the Indian consulate in Lhasa, that we would give up the military garrisons, uh, that India would give up the posts and telegraph offices, the dark bungalows, as the rest houses were called, beautiful ones dotted over, you know, the Chimbi Valley and on the road to Lhasa. All that was consciously given up. Be that as it may, I don't think we could have hung, hung on to those privileges, so, so we we can't fault Nehru for that. But I think where the, the difficulty arose and where India paid for that very heavily was the fact that the 1914 Simla Agreement, as it's called, which was uh, which finalized the McMahon Line, the Indo-Tibetan border, was something that uh, the British Raj had transacted with the Tibetan authorities on the uh, assumption and on the premise that Tibet was entitled to enter into such international agreements. So what normally should have been um, uh, what normally should have applied was that China should have been a successor state to accepting these obligations and agreements that had been reached between Britain and Tibet. But China has consistently refused to accept the legality of that agreement, the McMahon line between India and uh, and Tibet. And, the, uh, and India was aware of that, but Nehru was, you know, publicly informing the world that the McMahon line is our boundary map or no map, and the Chinese must have known it. The result of those discussions was that India essentially recognized Tibet as a region of China. It conceded Chinese sovereignty over Tibet without any concomitant agreement with China recognizing the northern boundaries that, uh, you know, delete, that separate the two countries. So that is what happened and thereby hangs my tail. Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. I experienced a bit of deja vu, I must admit, in reading parts of your book um, and then thinking about the current situation. So you write about China's aggressive infrastructure buildup starting from mid to late 1950s in ways that began to sound the alarm bells for the Indian military and intelligence establishment at the time. Uh, can one sort of draw a straight line from the infrastructural advantage China established back then to the imbalance that we see even today in 2021? Yes, I think uh, the Chinese had begun to steal a march over us even from the mid-1950s. And as I write, uh, the Aksai Chin Highway, the highway across the Aksai Chin Plateau, which connects southern Xinjiang, uh, with uh, Tibet, with Western Tibet, and then goes on to Lhasa, was literally built under very uh, the Indian eyes, literally from the early 1950s onwards. And the speed, the alacrity with which in, uh, China was able to build this network of communication uh, through the mid 50s, so that by 1958, when the when late 1957, when the news of the Aksai Chin Highway was essentially revealed to the world in the Chinese press. The Chinese had already begun to consolidate their presence in Tibet uh, through the help 
of this infrastructure network that they were building up, not only connecting Xinjiang with Tibet, but areas like Sichuan and Yunnan, which are on the literally on the Chinese mainland, if I may call them uh, as such, with, with the Tibet Autonomous Region. So, uh, you know, it's interesting that when the T Chinese came into Tibet in 1950, they had no such infrastructural support, and they relied on India for all their supplies, all the supplies for the PLA, all the food, all the essentials was essentially going through the Nathula Pass in Sikkim into the Chumbi Valley and on to Lhasa and other areas of Tibet. So that's, the, you know, the pas passage of history is very interesting to see from where they, you know, they came and to where they have come uh, at the moment. And today, as you said, that story has been carried forward, multiplied many, many times over. And China has uh, communications that reach right up to the border with Arunachal Pradesh. Counties and prefectures on the Chinese side of the nor northeastern boundary between Arunachal Pradesh and Tibet are connected uh, through fiber optic cables, through highways. Uh, they have tourist traffic coming into the area. And of course, there's constant development work and uh, and also, you know, building power projects and and who knows, you know, the China has de demonstrated its ability literally to move mountains in those areas. In your book, 1959 was a critical turning point, right? So it wasn't just the year in which the Dalai Lama fled Tibet, sought refuge in India, but it was also the year in which, you know, border tensions began to really degenerate in a, in a serious way. Uh, and I'm wondering if, is it accurate to say, with the benefit of hindsight, that this was the year that the sort of veil was lifted, that the Indian leadership internalized the sort of full nature of the Chinese threat? Yes, in many ways, yeah, or I would say yes, answer that in the affirmative. I think by 1958, uh, when Nehru, you know, made his visit to Bhutan and trekked at the age of 68 uh, over the Natula Pass into the Chumbi Valley on his way to Bhutan, because that was the only means of access into Bhutan at that time. By even by then, he had begun, uh, you know, it had begun to trouble him. He was constantly focused on this question, you know, has our trust in China been misplaced? He was beginning to talk of Chinese expansionism. Uh, the revolt in Tibet, the revolt of the Tibetan Kampas and essentially uh, Tibetan people against the Chinese had begun to gather momentum and strength. And uh, on his visit to Tibet on the way to Bhutan, Nehru was in some ways witness to this in the manner in which the Tibetans greeted him, weeping, prostrating themselves in front of him and saying that, you know, obviously see, looking upon him for any help or succor that they could receive. So all this did impact him. What happened in 1959 were there were two violent incidents along the border in many ways, recalling Galwan, uh, we had an incident at Longju in the northeastern sector, in the eastern sector, as we call it, of the border, in the Arunachal Pradesh section. In those days, it was called the Northeast Frontier Agency, at a place called Longju in August of 1959, where we lost some soldiers. And then in in October, uh, no, October it was, I think, in Konkala, which is in Ladakh, in in eastern Ladakh, in south southeastern Ladakh, where again we lost police personnel, and those two incidents, I think, really um, destroyed Nehru's trust in in China. And the decision taken simultaneously to publish all the correspondence, diplomatic correspondence, exchanged with China in the form of white papers, uh, educate or edu I would say educated, but did not enlighten. I use that uh, phrase, educated, but did not enlighten the Indian public or parliament about the subject. What happened was that there was a wave, there was a crescendo, a tsunami literally of nationalism that was unleashed at, as a result of this publication, which uh, then made it very difficult for Nehru, gave him no elbow room, no scope, no space at all to negotiate a settlement with China that could have involved some give and take. Because up until then, I think he was uncertain about the boundary in the Aksai Chin. He was very clear about the boundary in the eastern sector. But in the Aksai Chin, he understood that 
you know, that sovereignty from either side had not been exercised in a way that there had been a presence. India claimed this, and it uh, was territory shown within the Indian frontier on Chi Indian maps. And the Chinese uh, were not there in the early 50s. They had come in. So they had uh, moved there by stealth. And, uh, and if at all Nehru was willing to discuss and negotiate some settlement that would have adjusted Indian claims in the area, that possibility was forever ruled out once the correspondence had been um, uh, given to the public and to parliament had been published. And, uh, and you know, nationalism and public opinion was exercised about China. And the events in Tibet, the flight of the Dalai Lama also in 1959 did not help uh, to uh, to help matters or to alleviate tensions because uh, Indian people had always been attached sentimentally and emotionally to Tibet and the treatment of the Dalai Lama and the stories coming out as refugees from Tibet poured into India uh, did not make for uh, for any trust to be placed in China at all. You note in discussing India's disastrous 1962 war with China that it has become uh, de rigueur to blame Nehru for his wrong decisions on China policy. This is something that we talked about at the start of the show. Uh, policies that arguably led India headlong into a great strategic defeat. But you then go on to say um, something very interesting, which is that while Nehru may have been flawed, uh, he was flawed in a quote unquote heroic sense. How so? Well, he reminds me of, you know, the a hero from Greek tragedy or from Shakespeare in some ways, uh, bowed and stooped at the end of our story, desolate and completely tormented by his inner demons and, you know, his conscience about decisions he had taken in the past. And to me, he emerges as that tragic heroic figure because I think Nehru always wanted the best for India. And, uh, you know, in his desire to forge ties of friendship with China, I don't think he could have been faulted for that. Because in my own view, having studied and dealt with China, I don't believe there are, a, there are basic fundamental contradictions between India and China, as there are between India and Pakistan, for instance, you know. Unfortunately, history has made it thus. The history of our partition and our division has made our ties with Pakistan so fraught from the very, very beginning. We haven't been able to keep animosity at bay, as you know. I recall Pallavi Raghavan's uh, book, recent book. We haven't been able to keep animosity at bay. But with China, I think India and China could have kept animosity at bay, could have constructed a, a, a functional relationship could have expanded ties of interaction between their peoples in so many areas. I think there was room for that because it was, to begin with, not an adversarial relationship. It became one. It became one of adversaries, and unfortunately, it has persisted in that way. So I think Nehru's intentions uh, were honorable when it came to China. I don't think he can be accused of having betrayed the country. But the the sequence of events, the manner in which events telescoped into each other and led to the disaster of 1962, he as head of government, as the leader, you know, they called him Bharat Bhushan, the jewel of India. Many of his admirers did that. And he uh, was seen as you know, that infallibility uh, that was attributed to him, the trust and confidence that was placed in him was somehow, you know, eroded because of what happened uh, with the, uh, the defeat uh, by China of India in those disastrous months of 1962. So at the end of our story, yes, he's seen as, as this uh, flawed uh, you know, hero who's made so mistakes that have uh, have in many senses affected the country in a very substantive and in a very deep and profound way because the trajectory of India's role on the global stage changed immeasurably after 1962. And I don't believe we have been able to recover that prestige as much as we enjoyed in the 50s today, uh, although I believe that with the potential of India to become a leading economy of the world, to be that, uh, you know, that counter to China, 
uh, the way uh, the strength of India's democracy, the resilience of our you know social fabric in so many ways of our people, all that makes for an image of a country that has the potential to be a leading power in the world and will become one. But you know, 1962 and uh, the defeat that we encountered in those tragic months facing China has not faded. The memory of that has not faded. And much of that, I mean, the the halo that surrounded Nehru was replaced by this kind of, you know, this... Um, this this uh, whole sequence, this these many chapters concerning the relationship with China, by which he is in many ways judged by posterity, which is which is also part of the tragedy. Near the end of the book, after you narrate the fateful events of 1962, uh, you note that settling the boundary issue should have been a priority for Daru, and it never was. As a result. It produced this tragedy that we've just spoken about, for which both the man, the leader, and the country paid a price. If you fast forward to today, uh, my question to you is this. Is settling the boundary a priority for Mr. Modi's government? And if so, do you think, do you assess that the Indians are doing everything they can do to settle this long festering issue? I'm not sure, Milan, after what happened in Galvan, that... uh that is still as much a priority as uh, it should have been because the entire structure, the edifice of bilateral relations was was, uh, affected very adversely, some say even destroyed after what happened in Galvan. Today, the focus is more on uh, what India says, restoration of the status quo to get the Chinese to disengage, uh, to de-escalate tensions along the border. So that has become the focus. We haven't had any rounds of talks between the special representatives uh, who have were tasked with the settlement of this uh, issue, this problem, by um, their, the leaders of the two countries. So I think that focus has somehow uh, been uh, dissipated and there's been a kind of refraction of the vision towards more more towards de-escalation of tensions, more towards disengagement, and to see how the situation along the line of actual control can be managed better. Unfortunately, that management regime that was in place with the agreements on peace and tranquility and confidence building is no longer there. So the landscape of the relationship looks so much more, uh, you know, darkened. And uh, and the and there is there seems to be and I'm not optimistic. I would say I'm not an optimist when I look at the landscape of that relationship today. The differences have multiplied, have uh, you know, have become too numerous between us. And uh, and the question of trust, there is no trust between the two countries. And there seems to be, you know, the factors that the foreign minister, Dr. Jayashankar, talks about, mutual sensitivity to each other's concerns, mutual respect, uh, or mutual trust, all those factors are absent today. So I don't believe the settlement of the boundary is any closer today, uh, is not at all, I would say, close today. Uh, perhaps in the years prior to Galvan, with the efforts that we were being made by the special representatives, some efforts were being made, differences were sought to be narrowed, but today that doesn't happen. And that brings me back to the tragedy of Nehru. You know, Nehru's, I think, main tragedy is that he could, he and Cho Lai could have settled this, this question. The Chinese, I believe, were less rigid during that period than they are today. They were also looking, I believe, to uh, pacify Tibet, to make their position in in, uh, Tibet more secure. They were still, you know, newcomers to the global stage. They were still trying to establish a position uh, to cement their their role in many senses as as this new emergent country, uh, new power in Asia. So... In such a fluid situation, when uh, frontiers were being replaced by linear borders between the two countries, I think they should have sat down and settled the matter. And that is where I think the real tragedy lies. Nehru's, um, the fault lines, the fault of Nehru in many ways was not being able to see the urgency of that need. 
because he understood that the Chinese were expansionist, that situations were going to get worse, that the Chinese could aggress into Indian territory. So it was a question of timing. It was a question of moving at the right time to secure such an agreement, which, I th which was an opportunity we missed. And that is the real tragedy. So I'd like to conclude by asking you about something that you raise in the coda to the book. Uh, in it, you pose a, a pretty complex question. You ask the following, does India have a boundary problem with China? Or is there a territorial question that divides the two countries? And I have to admit, this is a pretty profound question. I'm not really sure how to think about the difference between these two. H how do you see it? Uh, let me explain. So when you talk of a boundary problem, uh, let us assume that boundary lines separate countries. And there are usually differences between, uh, you know, neighbors that come to the fore when you have certain pockets along these boundary lines that are disputed and which need to be settled. But uh, in, in the, in, as far as India and China are concerned, you look at the claims to territory that both sides have. The Chinese claim 90,000 square kilometers, I'm saying it in kilometers, uh, square kilometers of territory in the eastern sector, that, which is essentially the most part of Arunachal Pradesh. And in Ladakh, in the Ladakh uh, area, in the Ladakh uh, Union Territory of Ladakh, China claims 38,000 as in, as, and is in possession of 38,000 square kilometers of territory claimed by India. So this is the extent of the territory in question that, you know, is in dispute, let me say, between the two countries. So that is why I say it's not just a boundary problem, it's a territorial problem, territorial question also. In the 1950s, you know, Premier Chon Lai kept emphasizing during his talks with Mr. Nehru, that let's decide on a settlement based on the extent of administrative jurisdiction that each side exercises up to their frontier, their claimed frontiers. And uh, let us uh, look at that and then come to some uh, mutual accommodation, a mutual adjustment between the two countries and arrive at a settlement. Uh, so today I cannot think of that happening. Uh, positions have hardened, particularly on the Chinese side. They've hardened immeasurably when it comes to the northeastern boundary, the eastern sector of the boundary. And as far as India is concerned also, you have nationalism in both countries. And uh, the, the approach is not to cede an inch of territory. So the territorial claims will persist. Differences across the lines of actual control will continue and, uh, and will, will continue to bedevil the relationship. So uh, what you have as a result is, is a very poisoned chalice, I'm afraid. My guest on the show this week is Ambassador Nirupama Rao. She is the author of a brand new book called The Fractured Himalaya, India, Tibet, China, 1949 to 1962. My colleague Srinath Raghavan had this to say about the book. This is a study that is thoroughly researched, scrupulously argued, fair-minded, and elegantly written. It combines the historian's rigor with the practitioner's insight, as well as a sane appreciation of the benefits and limits of hindsight. The book deserves a wide readership, especially in light of where we are with China today. Ambassador Rao, thank you so much both for the book and for coming on uh, the show. We wish you uh, the best of luck with the release. Thank you so much, Milan. Pleasure to be here and to be discussing the book with you. Grant the Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com. India's fastest growing podcasting platform. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we reference on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Production assistance comes from Caroline Duckworth, Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff J. Pranada is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.